uh, just before we start talking about Egil, because today we, we will be introduced to Egil, and he was quite a kid, right? So, um, not your, not your very compliant little three-year-old, and what we know of him, he was he was difficult to control and very uh, obstinate. So he has gotten this entire saga to his name because he was unique from the very beginning. Uh, so we will be covering approximately those, the sagas that are assigned to de for today. Uh, I mean the chapters uh, 37 through 53 um, to some extent. We of course won't be talking about every single single incident, but kind of the key points here. And then after that, we still will be spending next week on Egil's son, and we'll get it finished before the spring break, and then we'll have the test on, uh, on what we've done so far. Okay, so uh, before we start looking at the chapters, in detail, and uh, if you don't mind, uh, like I'll gonna, I'm going to ask you to read a little bit if you don't mind participating, so it'll be not just me talking. So uh, I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures of Iceland, what an interesting place it is, and here is Iceland in the summer. When you read the descriptions, when when Egil, uh, when Skallagrim and his men arrived there, Skallagrim and, and his father, Kveldulf, they left Norway. Do you remember why they had to leave? It was because like the king was like... Exactly. Was going to come after them? Yes, they yes. They, they didn't have a choice really. I mean, they could have stayed there and been continued to be harassed by the king, or he may have even killed them, or what have you. That certainly wasn't unprecedented. But, but uh, so, uh, so Kveldulf and uh, Skallagrim, father and son, decided to leave Norway and go to Iceland, where there was plenty of space and no king. So this was King Harald, who was, uh, he was uh, very powerful, extremely powerful. Also at the same time, he was um, a little bit paranoid, like powerful people tend to be. They want to keep everyone out who is not totally agreeing with them and, and uh, being subservient to them. So <laughs> we, we don't have to go very far in time to, to see these kinds of, these kinds of people um, in positions of power that they want to keep everyone away who is even a slight possibility of rebelling against their thoughts or, or ideas. So, uh, so that's uh, a, a human trait. Not a good one, but, uh, but maybe that's how you stay in power. <laughs> um, I would think that there are other ways of doing that too, but Harald certainly wasn't hesitating to resort to violence and, and, and nasty things in order to get to keep his power. So uh, Kveldulf and Skallagrim left. Uh, what happened to Kveldulf on the, on the journey there? He died. He died, and yet he arrived there as well on his own in his coffin, and that, that's that was a kind of like interesting thing, which then the people who saw the coffin there, uh, they kind of took it as a token that this is this is okay because Dad came here, Quell Little came here on his own. We're gonna settle here, and uh, they came in the summer because that's when the Vikings traveled. They um, they couldn't travel uh, during the winter. Uh, the climate was much too harsh, so you get this in these stories. You constantly have have uh, these descriptions or these mentions that they wintered, they stayed over the winter in this particular place, and then spring comes, and these Viking men they become really kind of restless. They need to get 
going again and it's during the spring they, they make their boats ready and uh, they pack their boats, they collect men to come with them, their, their friends, their servants, their, their trusted friends and they, then they go for the summer on these, on these uh, uh, voyages uh, and often you saw in these readings that they often went to plunder, they went to, to places where they could just, you know, get some riches. Um, here is uh, Iceland in the summer and you see, you know, it's this rough, rough uh, yet beautiful place, um, but had they arrived there in the winter, this is probably something they would have seen. So, uh, so I just, you know, pulled some, a couple of random pictures of Iceland in, in the winter, and uh, and it's not an inviting inviting place in the winter. Of course, it can be beautiful too. You have the aurea borealis there in the winter, and they've got the glaciers, and but they also have these lava fields because they have volcanoes. Volcano. So you've got these. If there's a reference to black sand, that's the that's the lava, and um, it's it's just different, um, very different. And yet, about fifty thousand nor people from Norway went there. All right. So Egil saga continues. And, um, and I posted this, I hope you found this on the, uh, or will find this on the uh, weekly work under Icelandic sagas, the sagas of Icelanders, it's in, in that bigger folder. And uh, just uh, to make it a little bit easier for you to kind of like figure out who is who, because we've had a lot of characters in these sagas, and, and many of their names start with the same say morphemes, so, uh, so you know, you, you meet somebody whose name is, uh, is a little bit different, it's like, okay, I can keep this, this separate from the others, but, but uh, if you just keep, and, and we talked about this last time, but it's even a good idea to perhaps uh, build your own family tree to kind of keep everything, everything in uh, mind. So we've got uh, Kveldorf here. And uh, he, he was married to Salbjörg, uh, who was the sister of Eivind and Oliver, or Olvir. Uh, note that in different translations of the sagas, this is from a different translation, different edition, uh, different book. So uh, you sometimes have variations on how the, how the words are written. How, and so here we have um, the Kveldulf. Um, the night wolf, whose son is a uh, sons are Skalagrim and Thorolf, and they are Skalagrim Kveldulf's son and Thorolf Kveldulf's, uh, Kveldulf's son, and uh, so they were brothers, different brothers, and that's kind of like a key to it. Very uh, ambitious and uh, and handsome and. Good, very good looking Skallagrim, uh, gone bald uh, early at his age. So Skallagrim was married to Bera and Bera's father was Ungvar and we will be introduced to Ungvar but he's just a side character in, in our readings for today. And uh, so um, what has happened to Thorolf so far? Um, in the beginning, the king was like, you or your, like, Veldolf have to serve me. And then he ended up going to yes. the king. Yes, so he went to, he went to serve the king and uh, Skaladrim refused to, Kveldulf had refused to. Kveldulf had told Thorolf that this is not going to lead into anything good if you go and serve the king. But Thorolf was, you know, more kind of like, politically ambitious, I guess, and, and he went and, um, and he ended up getting crosswise with the king anyway, 
and, and be, because the king was manipulated, he was very manipulati manipulatable, and he was manipulated by whom? Wasn't it Hildred's son? Yes, these two guys, Harek and Hrarek, <laughs> Hildred's sons, and, uh, and they had some beef with Thorolf because Thorolf had inherited what they thought they should have inherited. And Thorolf inherited uh, their share because he married Sigrid, who had been Bard's, Bard Brunjolfsson's wife, and then Bard dies, and Bard was Thorolf's buddy, and Bard says, you can inherit my wife too, my house, my farm, everything, my wife too, <laughs> and my kid. And that's what ended up happening, and, and here we have these, these two guys who were very bitter because Thorolf had now what they should have had, and Thorolf was not very kind to them. It was just like, oh, I can't help you, sorry. And, uh, and uh, they go to the king, I'm just doing a quick <laughs> run through of what has happened so far. They go to the king and start talking bad things about Thorolf, who maybe, who is probably planning a coup against the king, and the king believes that, and then that's, that's what uh, ends up being Thorolf's end. So Kveldulf um, mourns, his son, of course, Galagrim, mourns him too, but he wants to get even. <laughs> Don't complain, get even. <laughs> That's the Viking uh, approach to life's problems. And, um, and then that leads to, to, uh, to problems because then the king, of course, uh, knows that there may be this avenge thing because the king himself had killed Thorolf, had dealt the uh, final blow to him. Okay, so uh, Skalgrim and Kveldulf have to leave, they leave, they uh, load their boats and they, they leave, they get to Iceland, uh, Kveldulf in his own coffin, Skalgrim still alive with his men. And we start the readings uh, by, by, uh, by uh, Skalgrim kind of like taking land and dividing, divi giving land uh, to, he was the leader, so he gave land to his, his uh, friends, his men, and so you, you stay here, and so you kind of, you know, get these, these long descriptions of where they settled and where they built farms. Now, Skalagrim did not just build one farm, um, he built several farms in several different places, so he was a very wealthy uh, person. But I mean, the similar kind of a thing happened here in in the West, in, in Texas. People came here, there was land to be taken. Sometimes it was taken from the natives, and uh, I mean, quite often, but here we didn't really have, there, there were no no natives in that sense, so it was a nice place to go to, uh, rough as it was, especially during the winters. But you could establish yourself there. And, and a similar kind of thing happened, uh, like from England, a lot of people came to America because they were like the second sons in the order of, of inheritance. And the oldest son, typically in England, got the, or in many other places of Europe too, the oldest son got the homestead. And the second son had very few options that they could become preachers or lawyers or something like that, but they would not be able to get part of the, part of the, their homes, the, the inheritance of the house, because it was very strongly believed that you, in order to keep the, the uh, farm, the estate going, you can't split it into pieces. And then that led 
to a lot of the second sums, just like, okay, I'm leaving this place because there's nothing for me here, so I'm going to go to America where I can have as much land as I can. And that's the story behind many of the, the early settlers. So here we have early settlers too who could also have a lot of, a lot of land as much as they, they were willing to take care of. So Skalagurin was very, very industrious. He, uh, he built all these farms in places that allowed him to do something. And then we have this one chapter where they uh, say about, you know, Skalagrim's, uh the chores, what he, what he uh, liked to do. He, there's this one description about his, uh, his uh, ironmongering, that he, uh, he found this place where he could, he could do iron work. And, um, and he didn't have a, a strong enough uh, plate or whatever you call that, uh, it's not my area of expertise. Uh, he tried to use some wood, but the wood wasn't hard enough, so he dives to the bottom of the lake to get the right kind of stone, and that's where he, uh, as an anvil, I guess, is that the word? So, Anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's, he, he has sheep, he has cows, and, um, and he does all kinds of things. So this is of the works of Skalagrim, uh, chapter 29, actually last, um, last time's reading still, but anyway, so Skalagrim was an industrious man. And, uh, what we also have here is we have a little bit of this chain migration thing because how do we end up with with all the people going there because one person comes and then part of uh, his his friends also want to follow up so we have uh, that's on page 49 shortly after Skalagrim arrived in Iceland a ship made land in Borgarfjord it was owned by Olaf, 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 Hjalti, who had brought his wife, children, and relatives with, with the aim of finding a place to live in Iceland. He was a rich, wise man of good family. And, uh, and so we have, you know, Skalagrim invited uh, him and his, his family to stay with him. And you notice that that happened, there was this hospitality. If somebody comes from Norway, then we who are already established here, we're kind of like obliged to invite these people over. And, uh, and you notice that uh, very often it's explicitly mentioned that this person accepted the offer. So it's this kind of like, you know, politeness that I offer you my place and it's then your obligation to accept the offer. So that all, often, very often, it led to to bonds, friendships, and people were like forever kind of like like bonded together because of the long winter that they had uh, lived uh, in, a, in a sense together. Of course, this place is could have been very big, so anyway. So uh, the, the stories, uh, the chapters, they go kind of like back and forth between Iceland and Norway. So chapter 30 takes us back to Norway. Meanwhile in Norway, King Harald Fairhair confiscated all the lands left behind in Norway by Kveldulf and Skallagrim. So they knew that this is going to happen. Uh, there was a mention that nobody would, they did not want to sell their, their place to anyone because they knew that King Harald would be coming after whoever was affiliated with them. So, uh, so they just left the place there, and lo and behold, the king uh, comes and, uh, and confiscates their places. And now we have um, Ungvar. And Ungvar's problem, Ungvar had to also leave too, uh, Iceland because Ingvar's problem was that his daughter Bera was Kalagrim's wife and uh, that's why uh, that's why he could have been in danger also because he had this this family relation close family relation 
with Skallagrim. Skallagrim was his son-in-law. And uh, therefore, um, Ungar had to leave. And Ungar uh, came there, uh, and, and it's kind of nice, uh, because in the, in the sagas, uh, in, the, in the chapters, you have this very matter-of-fact narration. But then uh, sometimes it's like, and it was a joyful reunion. And people haven't, if you, if you imagine, it's not just like, you know, taking, taking your car down to Houston to go and meet your friends there. It's, it's days and weeks uh, planning, and uh, I mean, weeks and months planning, and then, then the travel across the sea, uh, which is very dangerous, and then you don't know where you even land there in Iceland, and people land in different places, and then they have to find whoever. But uh, word traveled extremely well without the kind of media that we have, or telephones or text messaging. People always kind of like found each other. Now somebody has arrived, and this is such and such a person, and then there may be a joyful reunion. So uh, then we finally get to Egil. Um, we have um, Bera and Skallagrim had uh, the, the uh, saga tales. They had several children, but a lot of them died. Child mortality, of course, in, in the medieval world uh, was enormously huge, and, uh, and it it's still, I mean, that's, it, that, that problem has been fixed relatively recently. And, uh, and so, so they have lost a lot of children as, as babies and as, as uh, toddlers and very young. But uh, they had a son who's uh, the firstborn, I mean, older son was Thorolf, not firstborn, but, uh, but he was uh, Thorolf, uh, Skallagrim's son, and uh, Beras and Skallagrim's son, handsome. Tall, uh, nice. And then several years later, they had Egil. Egil uh, is explicitly said to be ugly, like Skallagrim, and very unlike his brother Thor Thorol, just like Skallagrim was very different from his brother Thorolf. Of course, Thorolf is named after his dead uncle, Thorolf. So, you know, we get this, this uh, recycling of names in the same way as, as is still the habit very often in today's world, names get recycled, family names get recycled. So Egil is born, and we are introduced to Egil, Egil in, uh, in uh, uh, on page 51. Um, so would uh, either of you, could you read uh, starting from page 51, 30, uh, 31? Yeah, 34. Yes, please. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Uh, Skallagrim and Vera had many children, but the first ones all died. Then they had a son who was sprinkled with water and given the name Thoral. He was big and handsome from an early age, and everyone said he closely resembled Veldulf's son, Thorolf, mm -hmm. after whom he had been named. Thorolf far excelled boys of his age in strength, and when he grew up, he became accomplished in most of the skills that it was customary for gifted men to practice. He was a cheerful character and so powerful in his youth that he was considered just as able-bodied as any grown man. He was popular with everyone, and his father and mother were very fond. Skallagrim and Vera had two daughters, Seon and Thoron, who were also promising children. Skallagrim and his wife had another son who was sprinkled with water named Egil. Egil. Egil, sorry. As he Egil, grew, Egil probably in Icelandic, but in English would probably. Egil. Egil, yeah. yeah. As he grew up, it became clear he would turn out very ugly and resemble his father with black hair. When he was three years old, he was as big and strong as a boy of six or seven. He became talkative at an early age and had a gift for words, but tended to be difficult to deal with his games with other children. That spring, 
Ingvar. Ingvar visited Tidborg to invite Skallagrim out to a feast at his farm, saying that his daughter Bera and her son Thor should join them as well, together with anyone else that she and Skallagrim had wanted to bring along. Once Skallagrim had promised to go, Ingvar returned home to prepare the feast and brew the ale. When the time came for Skallagrim and Bera to go to the feast, Thorolf and the farmhands got ready as well. There were 15 in the party in all. Egil told his father he wanted to go with them. They're just as much my relatives as Thorolf's, he said. You're not going, said Skallagrim, because you don't know how to behave when there's heavy drinking. You're enough trouble when you're sober. <laughs> so Skallagrim- Turns out he's three. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Skallagrim mounted his horse and rode away, leaving Egil behind his friend. Egil went out of the farmyard and followed one of Skallagrim's packed horses, mounted it, and rode after them. He had trouble negotiating the marshland because he was unfamiliar with the way, but he could often see where Skallagrim and the others were riding when the view was not obscured by mills or trees. His journey ended late in the evening when he arrived at Alfredames. Everyone was sitting around drinking when he entered the room. When Ingvar saw Egil, he welcomed him and asked why he had come so late. Egil told him about his conversation with his father. Ingvar seated Egil beside him, facing Skallagrim and Thorolf. All the men were entertaining themselves by making up verses while they were drinking the ale. Then Egil spoke this verse. Yes, so he is, uh, it turns out, this verse tells us how old Egil was when, when he just like, I'm not staying behind, uh, I, this is unfair. I'm gonna take my, my horse and uh, a horse and, and go and ride after them. And here it, it shows that he was, he was three. I would think that he must be closer to four than closer to three, but anyway, he, he, that's, uh, that's the, uh, designation here, so uh, he, was a, he was a weird little kid. <laughs> so I have come in fine fettle to the hearth of the Ingvar, and Ingvar was of course Egil's grandfather, because Ingvar was his mother's father, who had just uh, recently arrived to Iceland from Norway. Ingvar who gives men gold from the glowing curled serpent's bed of heather, and uh, on the side you get the, the translations of these. These are called kennings. When uh, something ordinary is referred to by, by this metaphorical, metaphorical thing. So, um, so um, serpent's bed of uh, feather, the hoard of treasure that it, it guards and the reference is made to this lore because this is a world where they knew about the earlier earlier stories of, uh, of serpents and, uh, and dragons. I was eager to meet him, shatter of gold rings, bright and twisted from the serpent's realm. You'll never find a better craftsman of poems, three winters old, than me. He believed in himself and he was not to be not to be left behind he wanted to go to see his grandfather just like everybody else so uh, we will see this uh, kind of a situation occurring later on when Egil cannot go somewhere because he is ill or he's not wanting to to go and even as an old man he is again left behind but he doesn't let it bother him. So, uh, interesting, interesting person. Okay, thanks. And then, um, then we are shifting back to Norway in uh, in thirty two. There was a powerful hersier, uh, and again, you know, you want to check what hersier is. It's a powerful man, a kind of a, a community leader. Uh, who has good connections, a lot of wealth, and so on. And uh, his name was Björn, or Björn, uh, meaning bear, who lived at Arland. Uh, his son, Brunjolf, inherited everything from him. Brunjolf had two sons, and again, we have the recycled name, Björn and Thord, who were quite young when this episode took place. 
back in Norway. Bjorn was a great traveler and most accomplished man, sometimes going on Viking raids and sometimes trading. So sometimes they did the, you know, the, <laughs> what we would call the honorable trading, uh, but uh, their notion of honor was quite different. Uh, raiding seemed to be seem to be not considered as what Christians would call sin and stealing. <laughs> and at, the, at that process, they ended up often killing a lot of people, taking their stuff. Uh, we'll come to a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, situation where, um, where um, Egil steals honestly. <laughs> so. Anyway, um, so so we go kind of back and forth, and uh, and that's what people did. On uh, 33, we have uh, Bjorn's faring to Iceland. By the way, I posted on Blackboard. I posted the list table of contents uh, of oh, again. It's from another edition, another uh, version of the translation. But what you have there is, because it's a table of contents, it has the names for all the chapters. So now we have just the numbers. But if you want to kind of like look at, look at a synopsis of what happens where, then that's a, that's a good resource. Keep in mind that the names may be written a little bit differently. Don't let that bother you. Okay, so... Uh, of Björn's faring to Iceland in, in 33, uh, they go to very, very different places. Uh, like here, for instance, just before winter, a ship arrived in Shetland from the Orkneys. So we're going towards what is Britain now. So the Orkney Islands, uh, Shetland, those areas there. And uh, they, um, they, tried to go there, and yet um, they ended up having to go to go to um, Iceland from from there. And then Björn ends up going to Skalabrin. Uh But there's a problem with Björn, uh, because he had a wife who if it's, it's probably not from here. Yes, it is. So, um, yeah, we have um, Bjorn again. This is from a different uh, different source. So we've got Bjorn here, and Bjorn had just taken a wife. It's it's kind of like really interesting. He had his he had he had his heart and mind <laughs> and body set on this this uh, this girl uh, who's who was Thorir's uh, sister and her name was Thora. She ends up dying relatively early, but uh, so we have Björn. Um, Thora, so he just goes and steals her, and uh, and he first uh, first does the proper thing and asks for her hand, but Thora herself says no, I'm not interested, and um, and he doesn't care. He goes back and and picks her up and takes her takes her with with him to his raids toward. England, <laughs> and, and uh, there um, um, he ends up marrying her. So he makes her an honorable woman, and uh, they end up having a daughter whose name is Oscard, and um, and she becomes kind of you know a Im more important character. But Thora herself dies. Thora was Thorir, uh, the her Hersir's sister, and uh, and and then you know you you notice that in in these um, 
in these uh, sagas, what we we often see is this: somebody offends someone. It was a really, really big offense to just take a girl, and uh, and then that it was unclear if it was accepted uh, by the family. And here the family was the father, I mean the brother, and, uh, and uh, it's just burned in care. Um, and then we have this back and forth that we somehow have to make good of having done something that was bad <laughs> according to the norms and customs and rules of that, that, that world. And, uh, and then there's always someone like a middleman, okay, I'm gonna go there and I'll, I'll speak on your behalf about this, this whole thing. When, uh, when uh, Björn and Thora arrive in Iceland because the king was after them, king's men were after them in England. They had to go to Iceland, uh, so people are escaping again. Um, Björn went to uh, Skallagrim, and Skallagrim was happy to see him, and they were welcomed. Now they were officially married uh, for a year, for a winter at least. They had just lived in sin, <laughs> so very, uh, not accepted in that world, uh, even though sin did not enter. It was against the customs. Uh, this was still pagan, pagan uh, world. And um, Skallagrim is very happy to see Björn and Thora with with him, but then he finds out that there had been this problem that Thorir who was Skallagrim's friend, had not accepted his sister's uh, marriage or, you know, shacking up with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Björn. And, um, and that was a bad thing, because remember that was also behind the problem with uh, Horrocks and Hrarek's inheritance because it was unclear whether Hildirid had been, uh, had been properly uh, married uh, with Björnbolf, even though she had, but there had been some kind of a you know, problem with, uh, with perhaps the family not giving the blessing. <laughs> so, so that meant uh, that Harek and Hrarek were actually called bastards at one point because, and they were like, no, our mother was married to our father, but then there was a question mark about it. How, how had that happened? What had happened first? So it was big in that world. Uh, it's, it was one of the strong norms that it has to be done in a particular acceptable proper order. You have to ask for, for uh, the, the people who have the power to give the girl or not. <laughs> and, and yet, interestingly, uh, the girls seem to have some say in this process as well. Like Thor, Thora initially said no to Björn. Maybe she ended up falling in love with her at some point. That would be the romanticized version. Maybe she was forever angry about having been taken. But it, uh, they ended up having a kid together. So anyway, so let's let's see. So we've gotten a lot of people to Iceland by now. Um, so Oscar is uh, is born to Thora and Bjorn. But what we learn here about the social customs, again, uh, in terms of Oscar, uh, she is taken care of by Skallagrim's wife, Bera, and, uh, and that was the fostering system. They lived together, uh, I mean close by, 
Uh, he, she, so she had access to her parents as well at that point. But then the parents want to go back to Bjorn, and uh, Bjorn wants to go back to Norway, and Thor comes with him, goes with him, and uh, Oscar is, and Vera asks if Oscar could stay in Iceland. And they're like, okay, fine. <laughs> so, you know, and this is not like going away, uh, parents going away on a date for a weekend or what have you. This is like four months and months. And they ended up uh, actually staying there um, in, in Norway. Well, they are reunited later on with Thoradais, but, uh, but Asgard goes back to Norway. So if we fast forward a little bit here is uh, time comes for Thorolf uh, Skallagrimsson to, he becomes restless, spring comes, he wants, he's in, in Iceland, he wants to go to Norway because his buddy Björn, he's been following Bern, Björn when Björn was living in Iceland. Uh, on their estate in, in, in uh, a sense. So Thorolf and Björn had become good buddies and Thorolf decides to go there. Now, uh, Egil says, I'm coming with you. Thorolf says, I'm not, taking, I'm not taking you with me because you're hard enough to manage here and if we go to Norway, then there's susceptible to all these social norms and power structures and the king first and foremost who has the power to you know even to kill you if you offend of offend uh, him and uh, there we are uh, uh, Egil being very young still is considerably younger than Thorolf and uh, he just says he wants to he wants to go and Thorolf says no and Egil says uh, okay if that's what you say then nobody's going and do you remember what he does? What does Egil do? Doesn't he wreck the ship? Exactly. He goes and breaks, he, re he, he just like, you know, chops the ship, Thorolf's ship, which was ready to go, he had his men ready, they were just, you know, getting, getting ready to get started, and, uh, and Egil um, does this horrible thing. Um, so, um, this is on page 64, um, in the middle here, um, a little bit lower than the middle. When it became known, most people condemned uh, the trick that Egil had played. Trick, I mean, you know, it's, it was a pretty bad thing. But he answered that he would not hesitate to cause Thorolf more trouble and damage if he refused to take him away. Other people intervened in their quarrel, and in the end, Thorolf took Egil abroad with him that summer. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, he, he had a way of getting his will done. But again, we have this, Egil's going to be left behind because he's the kid, he's the young one, he's difficult, he's impossible to manage. So Egil, is, Egil can't be taken there. And so we see this repeated pattern, but he, he gets his way and he's going with them. And so is uh, so is Oscar, and uh, and uh, uh, Thorolf actually wanted her to go so that she can be reunited with the father. And Bera uh, agreed that that um, she can go. So um, let's follow up. Now we are in in Norway and uh, you have these friendships developing. Uh, Thorir, uh, the Hersir, um, where is he there? So he has a son whose name is Orin Bjorn and uh, he became really good friends with Egil. Um, 
So Egil kind of like latched onto him and, uh, and follow, Egil was following Arnbjörn in the same way as Thorolf had been f following Björn uh, earlier. And they became good friends. Arin Bjorn was about the same age as Egil, a little bit older. So uh, it was like this role model. And they ended up living at Thori's Thori place. We have a different king now in, um, in Norway. Uh, there's been a generational change. King Harald has died. And his son, Eirik, has become the king. He's not any better in terms, not any more lovable <laughs> toward the people that he rules than uh, than uh, than uh, King Harald had been. Besides, uh, Eric, the king, marries this woman, uh, Gunhild, who has these magical skills. And, uh, and she turns out to be um, a, a big force, a powerful woman behind a powerful man, <laughs> in, so, so to say. So he kind of like, you know, guides, okay, these people are not, you, you should be putting your foot down uh, and not allowing them to do whatever they want. And them is, again, we have Egil. So we have this, this, this feud that had been going on between uh, Harald, King Harald, and Queldulf and uh, Skallagrim. Um, it continues in the next generation between King Eric and now Egil. So it's, it's the same thing. Uh, the same thing continues because Egil is not going to be taking orders from anyone. He's his own person, and and then we end up in these uh, in these difficult situations, which further the plot very nicely, <laughs> of course. So um, so let's go to forty two, and uh, it's on page sixty five. Um, Thorolf Scala Grimson, would you mind reading from the beginning of this? Okay. Thorolf Scala Grimson, as Tanitha Thorir, Thorir, what he would think if he asked for the hand of his niece, asked her in marriage. Thor answered favorably and said he would support him. Then Thorolf went north to Sala. So if you already have something oh, like that. With the fine band of men in reach Bjorn's house, mm -hmm. he was welcomed warmly there, and Bjorn invited him to stay as long as he wanted. Thorolf soon raised the matter with Bjorn and was asked to marry his daughter, Asker. Bjorn took the, personal, took the proposal favorably, and it was easily settled with the result that the pledges remained thin and bare, and the date was set for the wedding, which was to be held at Bjorn's farm in the autumn. Thorolf went back to Bjorn and told him the news of his journey. Thorolf was pleased that the marriage had been arranged. Yeah. When the day came around for Thorolf to attend the wedding feast, he would ask people to join him, inviting Thor and Ari Bjorn mm -hmm. first with their farm hands and more prominent tenants, a large party of worthy men. Just before the date, when Thorolf was supposed to leave home, when his party had already arrived to accompany him, Egil fell ill and was unable to join them. Thorolf and his men had a large, well-equipped longship and proceeded on their journey as well. Great. Um, isn't it kind of endearing that there's this, uh, a man goes and asks a relative if I can marry this girl, and, uh, and if it's agreed, then a date is set for a wedding, and <laughs> it's like, we, we get our traditions. Uh, I don't think uh, there is this formal asking for a woman's hand anymore from the male rel relative, but the date setting is still something that is, uh, that is an important part of this, this cultural tradition. So, um, so we are here, we have another marriage here, marriage bond, and of course these marriage bonds, they, they enforce the relationships between, because when, when you marry someone, then that entire family becomes part of your kin, and you are 
are obliged to take care of your kin uh, against whatever feuds may happen in the in the future. So um, if we go to sixty seven. Okay, by the way, you notice again, Egil fell ill and was unable to join them. So everybody else leaves and they leave Egil behind because he's ill. But then he, he, goes, um, he goes on his own way when he gets a little bit better before anyone, anyone um, returns. So they end up going, um, he, Egil, is recovering from his illness and he's back on his feet. This is 43, actually. Feeling bored. <laughs> um, it's, you know, th these kinds of comments, they kind of like make, make these people very real that Egil was ill and everybody else is in this wonderful big feast, wedding feast, and, and he's feeling bored. Feeling bored there after everyone had left, he approached Olvir and said he wanted to go with him. Olvir is a work person for Thorir, the powerful hearse there. And so it's, he's, a, he's a respected man, a farm hand, um, man, manager of the farm. And so Olvir is leaving to collect money from, you know, taxes from people uh, that have been kind of like left behind overdue taxi, taxis, and uh, Egil asks to go with him. He said he wanted to go with him. Olver thought there was plenty of room on board for such a fine man to join them. So Egil went along too. Egil took his weapons, a sword, halberd, and buckler. I don't know what kinds of weapons these are but I'm sure they are Googleable, <laughs> and I should have done that. Okay, once their ship was ready, they set off, but encountered rough weather with strong, unfavorable winds. All the same, they proceeded vigorously, rowing when they needed to, and were drenched. Okay, what we very often get as a description, that there was favorable wind, uh, the winds were favorable, or the winds were not favorable. And sometimes this seems to be like a metaphor of how a particular journey is going to turn out, whether the winds are, fav winds are favorable or not. In this case, the winds were not favorable. They got totally drenched in the, in the boat, and they uh, arrived at this island, which is called Atloy Island. And uh, they got there in the evening. They're totally, totally wet. And this is an island that was that had a large farm that was owned by King Eric. And uh, and then there was this bard person whose name was Bard Atloy Bard, a good steward who who served the king well. He was not of a great family, but was highly thought of by King Eric and Queen Gunhild. Now, what ends up happening here is really kind of interesting, because uh, because Bard, Athlod Bard, welcomes this boat full of totally drenched men, Olver and and Egil, uh, welcomes them there and gives them a space. Says, okay, go and get get dried. Uh, gives them what is called the firehouse. So, uh, so it's this big place which is a huge fire, and the men, you know, strip their clothes off and dry their clothes, and, and then they are served a meal, a wonderful meal, not a wonderful meal, but a normal meal with, you know, bread and curd and, you know, a gruel. I think it was gruel, curds and and gruel, and uh, yet there's something missing from the meal. What was that? Ale. Yes, and that ale is important for these Viking types. They were thirsty. They had been, you know, on the sea, very difficult journey, 
uh, exhausting journey. They they wanted to relax, and this is very often you you see that there's a dose of feast that everybody's getting kind of drunk. So uh, that was that was kind of odd. Well, of course they were thankful that they were able to stay there, but there was no ale, so they drank the curds, <laughs> and um, yet there was a reason why Bard did not take care of Olver and his men, Egil included, because what was the reason? King Eric in Hilbert. Exactly, King Eric was on his way. He was he came, he showed up and then he was given a huge feast in you know the main house and uh, and uh, there was plenty of ale and uh, Bard had just said oh it's too bad and he says it a little bit too often he says oh um, you must get by I would have preferred it's it's a great shame there is no ale in the house to give you give you to wel welcome you um, to give you the welcome I would have preferred you must get by with what there is and then he says again another time, um, I, I would gladly give you something better to drink if I had anything. Bart is lying. There was ale, but the ale was reserved for the king, King Eric. So we have an unfair, in a way, unequal situation here. And, and uh, the king comes there and Bart is still, you know, eating the, eating the gruel uh, with or tending to uh, Olver and his men. Of course, you always have to be careful when somebody comes to your house and they have weapons with them because you never know if these are you know, friendly or not. But, uh, but uh, then the king is like, where is Bard? And he's told, oh, he's staying with Olver and Olver's, me Olver's men's men. And, um, and King Eric says, oh, why don't they all come over here and we'll just have a big feast. And so they come and they see that there's plenty of ale. So this seems like a really silly thing, but in a way it's not that silly because, you know, uh, it just showed that, you know, you don't matter, but I am going to be, you know, uh, taking care of the king. And also Gunnhild comes. So King Eric and Gunnhild arrived at Atlo, Atlo the same night and they get this huge feast. Um, um, Bard had prepared a feast for the king because a sacrifice was being made to the Desir and this is a female guardian spirit, so it's a pagan thing. Uh, we, we, there is not much of this here, but we get, we get sometimes we get a glimpse. So there's a feast because we are offering to the this there, which is totally a pagan concept. Uh, again, check the glossary always at the end if there's a there's a term that is uh, that that is a new term. So, um, by the way, talking about uh, talking about these religion-related things, uh, we also read that that there, there's sprinkling of water when when a child is given giving given a name, and it's it's really really interesting. So it's just like you know our baptism. So um, there is not much indication that that. These were still pagan, but some of these traditions, they may be, I don't know, but it, the, the, there is, it's kind of like, okay, this is familiar, I know this, you know, you put, put water on the, on the head of the baby and the baby gets the name. So they were doing that even though they were, they were pagans, so, so which way, I, and I'm, I'm not a theologian, so, it would be interesting to kind of look what is what the 
what the, uh, of course, you know, baptism is, that it's kind of like the symbol that you leave the old world behind and, and get, get baptized in the Christian uh, world. But then, you know, we have baby baptism and adult baptism, and they're quite different in different denominations, and people feel very strongly about it. But here we have a pagans also sprinkling their babies' uh, heads with, uh, with water. Okay, so um, so they all have a really good time, and um, the um, ale was served. This is on forty-four. Many toasts were drunk, each involving a whole ale horn. As the night wore on, many of Olvir's companions became incapacitated. <laughs> Some of them vomited inside the main room, while others made it through the door. <laughs> so it was quite a, quite a fraternity party, so to say. Bard insisted on serving them more drink, and um, what uh, he is doing this for is to kind of—it wasn't necessarily very wise, but maybe. Maybe he wanted to kind of like make them forget that they had not gotten this ale, but he's not he's not uh, getting uh, getting away with that uh, because Egil at some point Egil is the one who drinks the most. He's a big guy, um, so maybe he could also handle most of it. This is uh, poem eight. This is kind of lovely of this whole genre. But you've got this very detailed, very kind of like matter of fact prose narrative. And then all of a sudden somebody bursts into <laughs> reciting a poem that they themselves made on the spot. So uh, here's Egil saying the poem. Uh, you told the troll woman's foe. Troll woman's foe is a noble man, the foe of troll women. Uh, a little bit of a sexist <laughs> metaphor here. Uh, you told the troll women's foe you were short of feast drink when appeasing the goddesses. You deceived us, despoiler, a despoiler of graves. You hid your plotting thoughts from men you did not know. For, for sheer spite, Bard, you have played a bad trick on us. And this really leads into bad consequences. Uh, people end up uh, being killed. Uh, of course, Egil uh, was he was he was drunk, but he seemed to have been able to hold his liquor better than the ones who started vomiting inside. Uh, it's kind of you know endearing that these were really uh, uh, these had these human human uh, traits. And then you know you have Gunhild who actually tries to poison Egil. So you, this this woman who, but Egil uh, figures it out and uh, and kind of he says he he spat the the poison on his beard or what have you. So um, so um, Egil ends up killing uh, killing uh, Ward, the host and. Um, and uh, very vividly expressed here at the at the bottom of page 68, he thrust the sword so deep into Bard's stomach that the point came out through his back. And then Oliver comes there too, but he's just drunk and he's spewing vomit. So it's it's extremely graphic. And uh, and then Egil is like, oh no, I better get out of here. And he does, so he um, he escapes. Uh, King Eric wants to kill Egil, uh, follows him, sends his men after him. Egil uh, finds an island, goes to the island, hides there. He actually swims to that island. Here we have another swimming, uh, swimming anti-hero. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he gets to this island, and uh, of course Eric's men come after him. Um, but what happens? How does he? 
Robert kills all the men? Yeah, so he's able to hide from the men and he goes to the boat where there are men guarding the boat and he kills two of them and uh, takes the boat and rows back home, uh, <laughs> however far that was, but very far. So uh, he ends up going, and of course, you know, meanwhile, the pe people who have been at the wedding, uh, Thoros uh, and, um, and uh, no, uh, Thoros and Asgard's wedding, so these people's wedding, and uh, they have come back home from the wedding, um, and Egil is not there, and they're like, oh, he's never going to come back because we heard. I don't know how these people were able to get these news always so quickly. <laughs> news traveled uh, very fast, and uh, so Egil is probably killed by King Eric's men. But, uh, but Egil shows up one, one uh, morning just, you know, in his bed, and... Uh, and there he is, and then everybody's happy that Engel is, is back here. And how did everything go? And he's like, oh, I, I ended up killing three men, Bart and the, the two guards. And, um, and everybody's like, you know, well done. <laughs> and uh, so we have it uh, like this totally, totally different world. And of course, you know, there was this way out that you know, if you kill someone, you can you can pay for that. So uh, it wasn't that, uh, but it but it's this this strange uh, honor. But then uh, then they go um, they go raiding again, and I wanted to show you this before we depart. So we've got um, a map of, of the Viking world, uh, the settlements, Scandinavian settlements. Of course, uh, Viking is a word that we often, we, we use Viking of a person, uh, and, and that's fine, but, but, but some, some people say that Viking is actually what you do, you go Viking. <laughs> And, uh, and that means this, this raiding and plundering and so on. All right, so what we have here is uh, where, where Egil's saga begins. It's Norway. Uh, that's where Quailwolf's uh, farm was. And, and this is the, the uh, west coast of Norway. And people go up and down, up and down. They sail, sail take their boats and, and, and go. Uh, whenever they need to go. And uh, this is all water, so very often, this is the place called Vik, V-I-K, which just means bay. And it's where, like, you know, today Sweden is. We already are familiar with this, this place here because that's the Beowulf's stomping grounds. And, uh, and, and they, they go along the, the, the river here. So we mentioned, uh, Denmark is mentioned, and they go all the way up here. But sometimes they also, there's a mention that they also went to Permia or Bjornland, um, sometimes today referred to even as, not really Karelia, but, but close, close there, the Karelians were mentioned. So, so they, uh, they have gone, sometimes they go across the, um, across the land, uh, along rivers uh, or waterways, uh, but I don't know how they went there uh, because going the northern route was uh, well, maybe maybe during the summer they uh, went on to to be very good uh, navigators and and, um, and sailors. So this place is mentioned. They went there to plunder, and then they go to Kerr. Uh, Poorland to uh, to plunder there very far. That's mentioned in Egil's saga. Then also uh, these places, Baltic uh, Baltic states. We've got today's Latvia and Lithuania here, Estonia. So these are the the Baltic uh, places where they went. Uh, Denmark and um, some interesting interesting things happened there 
in Denmark, they um, they went to just okay, let's let's go and um, rob this place, and uh, and they take everything from there and leave with all this like <laughs> Egil is carrying this big box of silver stuff inside um, as his personal personal um, whatever um, what do you call that like you know as his personal uh, trophy and uh, from that plundering trip and uh, there they um, they're carrying all this stuff from that place which they they just took the stuff and, and left the people uh, there and uh, because the people were again they were feasting and getting drunk and they had placed these as as uh, as prisoners there on the forum they get out, got out uh, and then all of a sudden Egil is like this is not right they don't know that we took this stuff, so I'm gonna go back. Let's go back and and let and let them know who raided them. And they go back, and he takes this huge piece of wood, which is burning on one side, because that was you know you you you, uh, you have this firehouse where you have this huge huge log which is burning on one side, and then the fire. Uh, continues to burn, so it was kind of like an easy way. It's, it was a central heating system in that world. And he took that well, they took that log and he goes into the main house and and uh, uh, puts the log there. So the, the fire starts, people die, but he's he wants to make it clear that they were the ones who took their stuff, and that is the strange strange honor but and his men were like oh you are crazy to go back there this was very successful we are on our way to back to our, our boats and we would just let's get out of here no Egil wants to do it the correct way so this is a strange strange honor system that uh, some of these Vikings are, are following. Right? It's like, you know, today, some, there's, a, there's a bombing somewhere, and then we wait, okay, which group is gonna be claiming this bombing? So it's not that different, in a way. But thank you, uh, that was it. Just little bits and pieces here and there of Egil's saga, and we'll continue next week.